Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about an online betting site that has been trying to aggressively promote itself in India. We also talk about the government putting curbs on rice exports. But first, we talk about the latest Human Development Report, also called HDR, which was released by the United Nations Development Programme last week. According to the report, India's rank on the Human Development Index has slipped from 131 to 132. Plus, the report also highlights how the Global Human Development Index has also declined in the past two years. In this segment, we speak to Indian Express's Udit Mishra about the report and its implications. Udit, before we talk about the findings of this report, could you begin by telling us what the Human Development Index is supposed to tell us? Yeah, so the Human Development Index has been compiled now since 1990 and it's a composite index. It uses uh, three, four parameters over health, education and income levels of any economy. For health, it looks at life expectancy at birth in number of years. For education, it looks at expected years of schooling and the mean years of schooling, the average years of schooling. And for income, it looks at the cross national income per capita in PPP terms. So those are the four parameters and it then calculates the overall index value and it gives you a sense of what's happening to human development in an economy or a country. Okay, so you mentioned life expectancy, average years of school and gross national income. All of these, of course, are very important metrics. So how does India fare in them? So predictably, India is quite behind many other countries. We are, according to the latest report, ranked 132 out of around 190 odd countries. So obviously, it's not a very high position. And I think the important thing to understand here is that even though India has improved across decades, across the years, we still remain far behind so-called developed countries, but even behind some of the developing countries such as China. So there's a fair distance to go on all parameters and especially in income per capita for India. And now one thing that this year's report has revealed is that India's rank has slipped by one point from 131 to 132. But the other thing is that the global HDI value has also taken a hit. What exactly does the report reveal about that? Yes, so this report is important this time because we've seen, the overall world has seen two years of back-to-back HDI numbers coming down, scores coming down for almost 90% of the countries. And that is primarily because the global economy, the global environment has been buffeted by one crisis after another. First, it was the COVID pandemic, which now is in its third year and with new variants. And there's a fair amount of disparity still in terms of vaccine um, availability. Then the Ukraine war, the cost of living crisis and the ongoing climate change problems that we keep hearing about, you know, floods at one place and too much heat at another. All of those have made it really bad for almost all countries. So HDI parameters or scores have actually worsened for almost all countries over the last two years, that is 2020 and 2021. And the decline is so substantive that it has wiped out the gains that were made over the last five years. So the world has been pushed back by almost five years on human development indices. And Udit, when we talk about India alone, is there anything that stands out to you about how we fare on these metrics based on this year's report? So, you know, every year's report provides these different metrics. So you take the HDI and then you sort of, one is obviously what HDI is telling you about India and how the performance has been. And it is very crucial to notice that between 1990 and 2000, the first decade, the average annual HDI score grew by 1.24%. Then it grew by 1.59%, roughly 1.6% between 2000 and 2010. This was also the period when India's perhaps economy grew fastest and stuff. And then from 2010 to 2021, the growth has decelerated to just 08 So it is a significant decline. That is one way to sort of look at over longer periods. But then the HDR Human Development Report also compiles HDI adjusted for different things. It adjusts HDI for 
inequality in a country. So for a country like India, which has massive inequalities, for example, in India, the income share of the poorest 40% is just around 20% and the income share of the top 1% is 22%. So when you have such massive inequality, what happens to your HDI? So when you adjust your, you correct your HDI for this inequality, because not everybody has the same life expectancy. Those are just average numbers. Then you find that India's HDI falls further. So what seems like a gain is not actually a gain in real terms. Or as we have mentioned multiple times before, that it's only a gain for a certain section of the population. True. There are gains in certain sections, smaller slivers of population, and those gains are substantive, massive, but they tend to pull up the average number, whereas millions of Indians, poorer Indians, much worse off, continue to languish at lower levels of improvement. And we have similar indices for gender, to look at gender development, to look at gender inequality. And we also have measures like the multidimensional poverty index, which looks at non-income ways of looking at poverty. You know, income is one way to assess poverty, but what are the other ways to look at poverty? And this time they've also adjusted the HDI for climate change, the planetary pressures adjusted human development index which is basically saying that how much emissions do you emit, you know, how much carbon emissions you emit per capita and where you find actually it's a silver lining that there India's HDI gets reduced far less than say a Finland or a Norway because they tend to use much higher per capita emissions. So their HDI actually gets knocked down much more. So there are many different ways in which the Human Development Report looks at the same HDI, adjusts us for different things and gives tries to give us a sense of where the economy or the citizens' benefits are. And Udit, earlier you mentioned that the world has been pushed back five years in terms of the progress that has been made on human development skills. Could you talk about how hard is it to actually make these developments? Yeah, so this is very important to understand what five years of being pushed back on HDI scores is because these scores move very slowly. We are talking about the expected age, life expectancy for a population of India's size, for example. So what has happened is that India's life expectancy at birth was 69.4 years in 2019. In 2021, it was 67.2 now, these roughly two years of life expectancy actually took us five years to gain. And that just shows you how difficult it is to actually gain something like that. And just to put it in perspective, China's life expectancy at birth is 78.2 years. So imagine you are at 69, you lost, you came down to 67 and a comparable country is at 78. And that just gives you the number of years. You know, if an increment of two years is taking you five years to achieve, then how much a increment of 10 years in life expectancy would take you? And this changes across the board, even in many years of schooling. To get more kids into schools and to keep them there, that takes time. Similarly, for per capita incomes to grow. So it's a process that moves at a glacial speed. It takes decades for countries to sort of move slightly on a particular parameter. And next, we talk about a betting site that has been trying to gain a foothold in India. The name of the site is 1xBet. And even though it has been banned in several countries abroad, it remains accessible in India, where betting and gambling is illegal. In this segment, Indian Express's Mihir Vasavda joins us to talk about this site and how it is managing to promote itself in the country. Mihir, for those who might not be familiar with it, could you tell them what 1xBet is? So 1xBet essentially is offshore betting company. It was founded in 2007 in Russia. And ever since then, like it's been in the news for all sorts of reasons. In Russia, there have been cases against the company. Its owners, allegedly, according to reports in the Russian media, they left the country and they relocated elsewhere. But the real issue, Shashank, with one next bet is that in almost a dozen countries, and we're talking about countries where betting and gambling is legal, countries like the UK, Russia, US, Netherlands, France, Spain, uh, the list is long, very long. And these countries have essentially taken action. So they've either outrightly 
banned one x bet blacklisted them or restricted their access because they flouted several gambling laws in each of these countries and exactly how did they flout these norms I mean, the most uh, interesting example is of what happened in the UK. Now, in 2019, uh, the Sunday Times, the British newspaper, it carried out an investigation into One X Bet and their activities, and they found that the company had been promoting betting on children's sports, that is, age group matches. They also were accepting bets on cock fighting. and in russia there were plenty of regulatory violations uh, and that's the reason they were banned there and very interestingly i mean in june this year you know, there's this norwegian football magazine which specializes in investigations called josimar and they found out that a uh, one x bet had been declared bankrupt in curacao it's a caribbean island and uh, it's significant because the company has acquired licenses from curacao which allows it to operate everywhere in the world to accept bets from other countries in the world so they have been declared bankrupt over there and in this backdrop we are seeing that they're trying to enter the indian market okay so this site has been banned in countries where betting and gambling is legal now in india we know of course that betting and gambling is illegal so how come people here are able to access the site and the company is able to promote itself so the website is in block that's a simple answer for it now there are two ways to it the company is presenting itself in india not as a sports betting website rather as a sports blog i think we have discussed in one of our earlier pods very long time ago where we had spoken about how these offshore betting companies are entering indian markets through surrogate ways we spoken about dafa bet pari match and, and all those companies one x bet is following the same template so it has launched a sports blog it has got yuvraj singh suresh raina and others as their ambassadors and uh, the moment you uh, google one x bet sports blog it of course has the link to the sports blog but the prominent link is of the betting website so when you log into the website then it's a routine thing but it gets interesting at every step shashank i mean given that like we discussed ki the website is in blocked in india so you can happily go to one expert website you can register yourself and then at every stage every step you kind of blown away by surprises so for example i tried everything except putting bet on it just to understand how the process works when i try to register on the website i had to enter my phone number give a basic personal details of mine and then i had to kind of get wait for a one time password and uh, it's strange here because the one time password except from the six numbers the message was in russian so that was kind of the first red flag you finish the process you have your own user account once you do that you realize that you know there are multiple payment options for an indian customer now like you mentioned betting is illegal in india so you really can't make direct payments i try to see what happens if i use upi and apart from upi you can make payments via net banking cryptocurrencies your bank cards your debit and credit cards for example so you have all those options Okay so when you tried to make a payment through UPI what kind of details did that reveal So again you enter your basic personal details of your UPI ID but say for example if you're booking an airline ticket or a train ticket in this case some agar jo example lay of of IRCTC when you're making a UPI payment the UPI ID belongs to an official IRCTC approved username right in this case the account where the money had to be transferred belonged to a third person and it kept on changing so i tried a few times over 3 4 days and every day it kept on changing so when you are making the payment you aren't making directly to one expert it is going to some third party first and then you are expecting that the third party will transfer it to one expert so this entire process is in direct it isn't instantaneous so if i have to make a deposit the website says it will be done within 15 minutes to 1 hr so that's another red flag and the third thing which again puts things slightly in a tricky situation is basically that the onus of figuring out whether betting is legal or illegal in a particular country is totally left on the user the company kind of raises its hands up and says we are not responsible if you go through the terms and conditions listed on one x bet you will see that it clearly states that it's up to the user to find out whether they are allowed to bet in their country and depending on that you can decide what you want to do so most of the users are perhaps not aware given that 
it's so easily accessible all these things you perhaps not even go through the terms and conditions it's a separate tab on the website it's a very long read and you'll require a lot of time and patience to go through all those points so this is in a nutshell how the website operates right and one x bet has been aggressively promoting itself cricketer yuvraj singh even advertised for it during the recent asia cup and other betting companies have also been promoting themselves on services like hotstar and sony live now you spoke to experts about this what did they have to say about whether or not these companies are actually violating norms so we reached out to a number of people we we reached out to hotstar to sony live who show these ads we reached out to yuvraj singh for his connection with one x bet sports blog we reached out to one x bet themselves and there was this another website called fair play fair play news which has been advertising very extensively during the asia cup and the us open apart from fair play news whom we couldn't really get in touch directly the others did not respond but we also reached out to the advertising standards council of india which regulates all the ads that are shown on television and uh, the ceo and secretary general of the advertising standards council of india manisha kapoor said that and i quote her the ads mentioned are in potential violation of indian government's laws rather than the asci's code this is a matter for judiciary and states to look into in the interest of consumer protection and is beyond the purview of ASCI having said that we support the government at all times in monitoring such ads when asked for so basically she says that these ads of one expert of fair play news are in potential violation of indian laws but it's up to the government to take action against them and mehir as someone who has reported on this previously do you see a pattern here has there been an increase in such companies promoting themselves in india uh it's been very aggressive in the last 2 years especially if you see it during pandemic and post pandemic it's just increased many folds apart from one expert and fair play which are only the recent additions you you've seen companies like dafa bet and pari match which we have earlier mentioned they have been associated in different ways with indian football kabaddi cricket through surrogate and, and direct ways i mean there have been international series which are broadcast on the ott platforms where you've seen betting companies directly advertising themselves and on the other hand now you have these companies which are essentially betting companies but put projecting themselves as news portals who are advertising in surrogate ways so it's just increased in the last 2 years despite warnings from the INB ministry from the other sections of the government as well as the advertising standards council of india despite their warning it's just going unchecked and in the end we talk about rice The Narendra Modi government in anticipation of a crop failure has decided to put restrictions on the export of rice. This decision is significant because India is the world's largest exporter of rice. Last year India exported over 21 million tons of rice which was valued at 9.66 billion dollars. In this segment we talk to Indian Express's rural affairs editor Harish Damodaran about this decision. and what it could mean for india harish this decision has come barely 4 months after the government banned the export of wheat from the country so what has prompted the government to take this latest decision i think there are two differences between that decision and the one which has been taken on rice wheat was a basically an ex post decision so that is after the event suddenly the government woke up to the fact that we have a short wheat crop and we won't be able to export etc just days before i think piyush goel the minister had said that india will be able to feed the world and all these things and then suddenly i mean out of the blue you know i think on may 13 they announced a ban it was an outright ban on wheat export whereas the damage to the crop was were happened probably you know in march after mid march there was a sudden surge in temperatures just when the crop had entered the grain filling stage so that was an ex post decision in the case of rice it's an ex ante decision that is it is in anticipation of a likely shortfall in production and depletion in stocks that might happen because the crop is yet to be harvested there is time the crop is yet to be marketed the procurement of rice that is paddy happens from october onwards whereas the call has been taken now itself and today we are in uh, september right i think the notification on rice 
exports, it came on September 8th. And the second difference, I think, vis-a-vis wheat is that in the case of rice, you don't have an outright ban. There are restrictions. So there are curbs on certain kinds of rice. So it's not a blanket or an outright ban on exports. Right. And there are four categories in this regard. Basmati rice and parboiled rice have been exempted, but restrictions have been put on white rice and broken rice. On white rice, there is a 20% duty now and exports on broken rice have been banned. So how much are these restrictions expected to impact India? My guess is, I think about 46-47% of the total rice exports. I think last year we exported over 21 million tons of rice. So in this case, probably around close to 10 million tons will get affected. And within that, whatever 10 million tons, something like almost 4 million tons would be broken rice, which has been prohibited. So 4 million tons is gone. And the remaining 6 million tons will be subjected to 20% duty. Okay, and these seem like big numbers. Is there a concern regarding any of this? Well, I don't think the export duty is going to make much of a difference because the fact is Indian rice is much cheaper than other destinations. For example, uh, raw rice from India, which has about, say, 5% broken content, is going at about something like $340 a ton, whereas uh, next cheapest rice is from Pakistan, which is about $380 odd. So even if you put a 20% duty, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference when it comes to raw non-broken rice, that is. And since India is not only the cheapest, but also the biggest rice exporter in the world, we have something like a 40% share in the market. So I think the duty will just get passed on. The real impact, I think, is going to be felt in that 4 million tons broken rice. That is the one which is going to be affected. So if you look at, say, total, say, 20 million tons, 20, 21 million tons. So 4 million tons, I think, that is out of the market. That market is gone. And Harish, when we specifically talk about the ban on broken rice, how do you view this decision by the government? I believe that the decision to ban broken rice exports was a retrograde one. Because the fact is, the difference of it is that this is any anyway sort of inferior grain and it is being basically used by the Chinese and the Vietnamese and the Indonesians for uh, feed purposes. But my question is, why should it be banned? I mean, till exports were happening, broken rice was selling at a discount in India. Millers were getting a pittance for the broken rice and they had to sell it at much cheaper than the what you call as the head grain, which is basically the whole grain. So if there is a market for broken rice, why not? And why should not uh, our millers, our traders and farmers benefit from it? So I'm principally against a ban on any exports. Tariffs are fine. So my feeling is maybe you should have had a straightaway 20% tariff on broken stool. Instead of a complete ban, it should have been just 20% duty. So which would have been fair, I think. So you would have had a situation where you allow basmati and parboiled rice exports to continue. And all other exports, you have a 20% duty. That would have been simple instead of creating four categories. So you have three categories, actually not even three categories, two categories, you know. So basically premium rice, which is basically parboiled and basmati on which exports will continue. And a second category, which would have been non-basmati, non-parboiled rice on which you have a 20% duty. I think that would have been the right approach instead of suddenly, you know, putting a ban on rice exports. Because, uh, see, markets take time to develop. You cannot just suddenly, you know, a single stroke of a bureaucrat's pen, you know, you just stop exports. So that's not a good, it's an extremely retrograde move. I hope that the outright ban is replaced by an export tariff. And the same thing could have been done even with wheat. You know, instead of a ban, you impose a tariff. And tariff you can increase or decrease based on what the world prices are, etc. And tariffs are a legitimate instrument. Whereas quantitative uh, restrictions and export bans, etc. are completely anathema in the world of liberalization. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcasts at indianexpress.com.